Good evening, everyone. My name is Jen, and I am a librarian with the Santa Cruz Public Libraries, and I am very excited to bring you Naturalist Night this evening. Uh, if you have not joined us before for Naturalist Night, this is a joint program between the Santa Cruz Public Libraries and the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. Every month we focus on a different ecosystem uh, local to Santa Cruz. And this month we are talking about sand hills, which is very exciting. Uh, we have two presentations from Marisa Gomez of the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History and Wayne Thompson, who, uh, Marisa, where is Wayne from? The university? Uh, Wayne is a science teacher and Santa Cruz local who has been exploring the sand hills since he was a wee one and also um, is a paleontologist. So he's assisted the museum on many occasions over the decades mm -hmm. um, with our paleontology collection. Very exciting. So we've got a good uh, set of presentations for you this evening. Uh, we do want it to be somewhat interactive, so there will be prompts for you to um, unmute yourself and interact with us. We don't want you to just like sit there and be lectured at for an hour. Um, we do want this to be somewhat interactive. So Marisa will prompt you when it's time for those sorts of interactions. Uh, but before we get started, I just wanted to go over the guidelines. Uh, number one, this program will be and is being recorded now. Um, so if you have to duck out early, you can always catch it on the library's YouTube channel. Um, otherwise, just FYI, it's being recorded. Uh, number two, uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, enter them into the chat box. If you uh, have a question during a response that Maurice is calling out, uh, you can always unmute and ask your question there. If you need tech assistance, go ahead and just ping me in the chat and I'm happy to do what I can to resolve any Zoom issues uh, remotely. Number four, this is a family event, so please try to keep your language appropriate. And number five is enjoy the presentation. Um, and just in case we do experience another power outage, um, if it happens early on in the session, we can always reschedule for another time and date. Uh, but with that said, I am going to go ahead and give the reins over to Marisa. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, let me share my screen. Try that out. Okay. Great. Um, so welcome, friends. Welcome, everyone. Uh, here we are at the, the end of a wild year, and we're also coming to the, to the close of, of this series. And so I just wanted to start by sharing how grateful I am to the Santa Cruz Public Libraries for their partnership with our Naturalist Night series and uh, to everyone who has joined us over the past six months. We've, uh, you know, we've all developed a lot of skills over this past year, I think. And for me doing these presentations um, has been a great opportunity for me to develop my own skills. So thank you for joining me on that journey. Um, and I also hope that you also feel like you have uh, been able to deepen your skills as a naturalist in the process. And for those of you who this is your first one, well, like Jen said, uh, we put these all up on on the YouTube uh, and on the museum's website. And so you can go back and, and look at others. Um, before we jump into Santa Cruz Sand Hills, I did just want to take a moment to share a little bit about me and about the museum. Uh, so I am Marisa Gomez. I'm the public programs manager at the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. And we have been a part of this community for 115 years. We are Santa Cruz's first museum. I have only been a part of the museum for five of those years. Um, but we aim to connect people with nature and science in order to inspire stewardship of the natural world. And we also operate with these core values uh, that I have listed here, which I share because this is really what I hope you all are able to get out of today. And I hope you feel comfortable sharing your thoughts and questions throughout. And uh, so with Naturalist Night, every month we explore a different habitat of Santa Cruz. So far we've covered like a general overview of Santa Cruz habitats and history. We looked at the intertidal zone, redwoods, coastal prairie. And today we're looking at one of my favorite Santa Cruz habitats, the Santa Cruz sand hills. And like I said, programs like this are meant to connect our community with our natural spaces, but with the end goal of inspiring us to maybe make a difference. So I thought we could start with this question, why do we conserve spaces or landscapes to what end? Uh, so if you have any thoughts on that, you can um, chime in, feel free to unmute yourself. We'll see how that goes. You can also write them in the chat. Just what are some of the reasons why we um, have efforts of conserving 
open spaces, public spaces, landscapes. And I have some thoughts that, uh, that have come to mind for myself that I've generated, which I will share now, but feel free to keep adding them in the chat. Um, so these are some of the things that, that sometimes come up when we talk about conservation efforts. And some of the things that you've thought about, maybe you see on this list, maybe there are others that are missing, which again, put them in the chat. Um, and maybe some of these things that you see on here, you disagree with. <laughs> and that's also one of the things that comes up with conservation is that sometimes we got to work with differing um, uh, motivations. And so um, conserving spaces helps us to support wildlife, but it also adds to the community appeal of an area for you know monetary reasons of like tourism and uh, real estate, but it's also about enriching the next generation. And it can also be about recreation, um, access to exploring places. Um, so the habitat that we are going to be exploring today is one that local people and organizations have been working towards conserving for quite some time because of its rare qualities uh, of the landscape, but also because it's becoming exceedingly rare in scope. Once covering up to 7,000 acres, the Santa Cruz Sandhills are now down to about 4,000 um, and only 2,500 of those acres are completely undeveloped. And you know, one endemic buckwheat or beetle may seem like a drop in the bucket, but our ecosystems are incredibly complex. Uh, and these complexities may not even be entirely understood. Uh, also, these ecosystems are under a lot of stressors for massive species decline in birds and insects over recent decades to habitat loss due to development and invasive species and ongoing impacts of climactic stressors such as drought and extreme weather events. Um, changing management regimes and land use values have also led to habitat type conversion for many of our rare habitats, including coastal prairie, which we talked about last month, um, which often can transition to coastal scrub if um, basically not managed. Um, and then with the Santa Cruz Sandhills, there's, there's risk of type conversion as well. So protecting these rare habitats that have already greatly diminished in scope um, that support species with super unique traits, which we're going to explore. Um, these are all important things and increasingly so. And before we get too deep into the nuances of this habitat, I want to give credit to the Sandhills Alliance for Natural Diversity, which the museum has a history with, um, and specifically Jody M. McGraw, whose publications on the Santa Cruz Sandhills are the basis of this presentation. And we're going to be sharing links to those resources after the program. So where are the Santa Cruz Sandhills? If you have visited the Sandhills um, before, why don't you share in the chat uh, your favorite places to go visit the Sandhills, maybe a certain park or general, general region. I see Quail Hollow, Henry Cowell, Bonnie Dune, Quail Hollow, Henry Cowell. Yes, very good. Um, so this is a map of the distribution of the Santa Cruz Sandhills biotic region or habitat produced by the Santa Cruz County Planning Department in 2011. So that's one map that kind of shows um, general distributions of this habitat type. There's another map overlaid. Um, and this one is uh, was featured in Bay Nature Magazine created by Ben Pease. Some of the best places to view the Santa Cruz Sandhills habitat as you can see here are um, Henry Cowell Redwoods State Park, Quail Hollow Ranch County Park, the Bonnie Dune Ecological Reserve. There's also some pockets um, in the upper parts of Wilder Ranch. Um, and there's quite a bit on private property as well. All right, so what are they? What are these Santa Cruz sand hills that we are gonna be talking about today? So um, importantly, they are outcrops of sandy soil. That's very important for when we talk about the, the Santa Cruz Sandhills. And this um, type of soil is called the Zianti series, generally found near the towns of Scotts Valley, Felton, Ben Lomond, Boulder Creek, Bonnie Dune. The soils are derived from the weathering of the Santa Margarita Formation, which is an ancient seabed deposit from 10 to 12 million years ago that has been uplifted over the course of millions of years so that it is now way up high in the mountains. Um, and it's not like super easy to see on this this map, um, even though it's a beautiful geologic map, but uh, the Santa Margarita formation is the kind of reddish, orangish areas there. 
So why don't we just do a quick refresher for those of you who have joined us for other naturalist nights, you've seen this slide before multiple times <laughs> because it always comes up whenever we talk about the different habitats of Santa Cruz, talking about the geology of our mountain range um, and the, the rocks that make up our soils are it's very important. So we're just gonna do a quick refresh. Um, so we're gonna talk about the effects of the San Andreas Fault on our region. And this is a sliding boundary between the Pacific plate to the west and the North American plate to the east. Um, and so like if you're standing in Los Gatos, California, you're on the North American plate. If you're in Santa Cruz, California, you are on the Pacific plate. And for a long time, this boundary was a subduction zone where the Pacific plate was sliding underneath the North American plate. But about 30 million years ago, this relationship changed and the fault formed when it started to move in what is called a right lateral strike slip fault. Um, and so now as it moves, it causes uplift and little by little over thousands and millions of years, the mountain range has formed, which is why this ancient seabed formation is found hundreds of feet above sea level. And while we're in geology land, I do want to note that there's a lot to talk about with the geology of the sand hills, but I'm going to kind of like zoom through it because like Jen said earlier, we have a special guest with us today, Wayne Thompson. And so um, once I kind of do this general overview of the sand hills, we're going to look more specifically about at the fossils of the Santa Cruz sand hills. So um, stay tuned for that. It's coming, coming soon. So the reason why the Santa Margarita formation is important important um, to note for this habitat type is because the weathering of that formation is the foundation of all of the life found in the Santa Cruz sand hills because the Zianti soils of this habitat are derived from eroded Santa Margarita sandstone. These Zianti soils contain greater than 90% sand particles, which means that water drains very rapidly through the soil type. Um, the light gray soils also have low organic matter and as a result, Zianti soils have low availability of nutrients and soil moisture and are not conducive to most plant growth. Um, so not so great for a lot of the plants that we have around Santa Cruz, but there is one benefit um, that we see from this soil type and that is that it serves as a natural filter for the Santa Margarita aquifer, um, which is a source of water for thousands of people in uh, the central Santa Cruz County. And when the rain falls onto these hills, the water percolates through the sand and into the aquifer. And this is um, where a lot of people get their groundwater from. And then it also um, continues to feed straight into the San Lorenzo River, helping the water quality of that river um, and important species like steelhead trout and endangered coho salmon. Um, so all around, these sandy soils that we're talking about, the Zianti soils, they are also surrounded by loamy soils and clay soils, these, um, these soil types that support our redwood trees and different habitat types. And so when you go into the sand hills, it really feels like you've entered another world. I don't know if any of you out there um, know what I'm talking about with this, like if you've experienced the same thing. Um, but like you walk into the sand hills and all of a sudden you feel that the weather changes or you feel that the ground below you changes. There are little hints all over you that all of a sudden like something is different. Um, and for me walking into a sand hills habitat in Santa Cruz County is like that. It's like a visceral experience all over me because it's so different from the surrounding habitat types. Um, and so on this slide, these images are from a walk that the museum hosted a couple years ago with local ecologist Gray Hayes at the Bonnie Dune Ecological Reserve. And in one image, you can see that Gray is surrounded by like ferns, um, a little bit of scrub, some flowers. And um, to the right, just a few minute walks away in the reserve, all of a sudden we were surrounded by really, really tall manzanitas and then madrones. And then all of a sudden we were in mixed evergreen. And it's just like so quick. It's so different um, when you go from one of these habitat types to another. And that's really because the soil changes. Um, and even just driving up into an area like Bonnie Dune Ecological Reserve, you're driving up Bonnie Dune Road and you're just going up, 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 up into the redwoods, just completely wooded, 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 wooded. And then all of a sudden you turn onto Martin Road and it just opens up because the soil type means that different things grow there, which I think is really exciting. Um, so now we're gonna talk about uh, some of those unique plants that, uh, that exist within this soil type. 
So there are two plant communities that make up the Santa Cruz sand hills. There's the sand chaparral on our left here. Sorry, these images aren't aren't the greatest. Um, they're screenshots from uh, from Jody McGraw's website. Um, but so you got the sand chaparral on the left, and then you got the sand parkland on the right. And the sand chaparral is the most common of the two, with about like two to three thousand acres in existence. And it's characterized by the presence of the silver leaf manzanita, which is endemic to the sand hills. And this is um, what you see when you visit the Henry Cowell Observation Deck, when you visit the Bonnie June Ecological Reserve, they're the sand chaparral plant community within the Santa Cruz sand hills. And then the other plant community type is the sand parkland. And this is much more rare, um, just about 240 acres left. Um, and you can visit this plant community characterized by the presence of ponderosa pines at Quail Hollow Ranch. And there's also um, a good amount of it on private property owned by the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County. And I believe that they open up that property periodically for, for like special private tours. So within these plant communities, there are some rare plants and there are actually four plant species that are found only in the Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz sand hills habitat. They are not found anywhere else on earth. They're not even found anywhere else within Santa Cruz County. They're only found within this habitat type. And the first that I will share with you is the Santa Cruz wallflower, which is Erisimum teratifolium, maybe. Um, and it's an herbaceous plant in the mustard family. This endemic plant is found almost exclusively in open sandy areas within sand parkland, so not in sand chaparral. Um, so it's more limited than some of the other endemic, endemic species. Um, there's only 17 locations within the sand hills, according to Jody McGraw. The next is one of my absolute favorites, and this is the Ben Lomond spine flower. This flowering plant is in the buckwheat family, which is probably why I love it. Um, and it can be found in both the sand parkland and the sand chaparral. These are images that I took at the Bonnie Dune Ecological Reserve. You can see that bees love it. And it's a it's a fun plant that, that really just carpets an open area. So when you go to the Bonnie Dune Ecological Reserve, um, there are parts that are very, very much covered with this silver leaf manzanita. And you don't really see the spine flower there as much. You might see it along the, the trail where it opens up again. Um, but there are other little pockets that haven't been encroached by those shrubs and it'll just carpet it. Um, and it, sometimes I think you overlook it because it kind of blends in with the sand, but it's beautiful and, and uh, worth a look. Very tiny, very pokey. Um, another beautiful buckwheat here. This is a subspecies of naked buckwheat. Um, and like many other sand hill plants, the Ben Lomond buckwheat has white hairs on its leaves that reflect excess sunlight and reduce water loss. So thus adapting it to life in the hot, dry sand hills. Another favorite of mine, again, probably because it's the buckwheat. Um, this endemic plant is named after its silvery leaves, which reflect excess sunlight. And again, reduce water loss, all these adaptations that these plants have. Um, it's the dominant plant of the sand chaparral plant community. It's the silver leaf or Bonnie June manzanita. And when you go to, again, the Bonnie June Ecological Reserve, which is my favorite, um, you see this manzanita, but there's also, I believe, um, upwards of a dozen different manzanita species within that one ecological reserve. So you've got to look carefully <laughs> to, to identify it. Um, there are also plants within this habitat that are rare, but not exclusive to the Zianti soils, such as the Santa Cruz monkey flower, which you see here. Um, and then also the ponderosa pine, which Many of you may be uh, familiar with from say the Sierras, but don't necessarily associate it with Santa Cruz so much. Um, and in the Sierras, you find ponderosa pines at like 3000 feet elevation, but here in Santa Cruz, just a few hundred feet from the coast um, and just a few hundred feet in elevation, you've, uh, you've got these ponderosa pines, which are uh, what we associate the sand parkland uh, plant community with, even though this image um, was taken, I took at the Bonnie Dune Ecological Reserve again, if you can't tell, it's my favorite. Um, so there are ponderosa pines there, but they're just not the dominant species at the Ecological Reserve. The dominant species is that silver leaf manzanita. And one other one that I wanted to point out is the Santa Cruz cypress, 
which is endemic to the Santa Cruz Mountains. And one of the biggest threats to this plant is actually lack of fire. Um, so heat causes the cones to open up their seeds. So for the Santa Cruz Cypress, in order for it to um, spread its seeds around, it needs heat in order to open. Um, and then they drop their seeds. And in order for those seeds to actually grow, they require sunlight and bare mineral soil to germinate. So this is an adaptation of this plant where the heat indicates that there is most likely going to be bare soil that will receive sunlight because fire has come through to clear out brush that might otherwise um, make it so that those seeds don't get what they need in order to germinate. Um, and another aspect of this plant is that seed viability reduces as the tree ages. So I think peak maturity is around 10 years. Um, and by the time the tree is about 30, it, it basically dies and it doesn't, um, it's not able to produce viable seeds anymore. Um, so if you don't get large disturbances frequently enough, if you don't get large fire disturbances frequently enough, then the trees won't re reproduce often enough to maintain their population size. Um, so that's the big concern with this species. And all of the remaining stands of Santa Cruz Cypress were within the CZU Lightning Complex fire zone. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see how they respond to that fire event. Um, this picture on the bottom right here was taken by Natalie McNear in September of 2020 in Bonnie Dune. And you can see how it opens up um, to let uh, the seeds drop. So thanks for Natalie for letting us use this. I saw her post it to a California Native Plant Society forum um, and just thought that it was a really wonderful example of, of this process. Um, and speaking of fire adapted species, this one is too. So we're, um, we've chatted about plants. We're going to chat a little bit about critters now um, because the, this habitat has unique qualities that support unique life, both in terms of flora and fauna. And the Santa Cruz kangaroo rat is also found only in the Santa Cruz sand hills. But unfortunately, maybe not for long. We'll see. Um, the only known remaining population is also threatened by fire exclusion. When there is fire that comes through these habitats, it creates gaps in the shrub canopy, which are required by the kangaroo rat. Um, so when you don't have that and you get this, this overgrowth, it impacts the kangaroo rat. Um, and also when people trespass on protected areas, they can collapse burrows and erode soil. So it's important to respect those boundaries um, so that we can help this, this little kangaroo rat out, which also the kangaroo rat more closely related to a gopher than a rat. Also endangered is the Mount Hermon June beetle. And this little guy uh, lives underground as a larva feeding on the roots of plants for about two years. But adult beetles, they don't eat. Uh, the, they live solely <laughs> um, to, to uh, explore and look for a mate. So they instead emerge from the sandy soil solely for the sake of finding a mate. The females uh, don't fly, but the males do fly around. And like other sandhill endemics we've talked about, this animal is impacted by habitat loss, but also by habitat degradation, including night lighting, so light pollution, which attracts adult males away from their habitat during mating times. So when they normally fly around looking for females um, at twilight, they may get distracted by, um, by light pollution and leave their habitat, and then they're not where their mates are. So why are these species endangered? We've been talking about this a little bit. Um, and actually, I'm just going to share, this is actually a, a slide that's copied over directly from last month's talk on coastal prairies, because the same factors that th threaten the habitat, uh, the coastal prairie habitat also threaten the Santa Cruz sand hills. We, um, we revisit a lot of the same themes over and over again. Um, according to the Sand Hills Alliance for Natural Diversity, the sand hills once covered about six to 7,000 acres, but approximately 40% of that has been lost and the rest is facing steady degradation because of things like what we just saw on um, this slide, habitat loss due to invasive species development and those lack of disturbances like fire. Um, and also I wanted to point out quarrying because if you live in the area, 
um, you're probably familiar with our quarries. If you drive around, you know, Mount Hermon Road or um, San Lorenzo Valley, you see these areas that have been quarried. And those quarries target the Santa Margarita sandstone, which we were talking about earlier. And the reason why um, people are interested in that sandstone and in that soil type is because it's a really well-worn and well-rounded type of sand. So it's actually less abrasive to machinery during construction. Um, it also has a neutral pH as opposed to beach sand, which comes with a lot of other kind of stuff in there. Um, whereas the, the Santa Margarita uh, sandy soil is a little bit more pure. Um, but it does apparently have high aluminum content, which apparently makes it valuable for manufacturing glass products. And I don't know the reason why, but I um, have read that it uh, is great for high-end glass qualities such as optics, um, as well as fiberglass windows, windshields, things like that. Um, and since its inception in the early part of the 20th century, sand quarrying in the sand hills has occurred in six different quarries, um, which have removed an estimated 450 acres of habitat and fragmented remaining habitat. And um, it does not appear that habitat is able to recover after quarrying. So that's one uh, major effect. Um, and then I did wanna to touch again on fire suppression um, and just dive a little bit deeper into that since it's been something that's uh, really been on our brains uh, in our community given events of this year. Um, so these are images from the Sand Hills Alliance for Natural Diversity that show how decades of fire suppression um, have led to some habitat conversion um, at the Bonnie Dune Ecological Reserve. And maybe it's a little hard to tell here, but um, in the left, there's a lot of pockets of like pretty pristine white, whereas on the right, it's been overtaken by, um, by, plant, by plants, scrubland, different things like that. Um, and so that's going to impact your plants like the um, spine flower that we were looking at that needs that open space. Um, and fire suppression, it really means that um, you're not keeping uh, certain plants at bay. You're not creating that open space. You're allowing plants to, to encroach in. And that's going to affect the Santa Cruz kangaroo rat, the Santa Cruz cypress. Um, and in order to really understand the history of fire in Santa Cruz, because if we're talking about these species that are fire adapted, it means that there's been fire here for a long time, right? And so in order to understand that, one thing that we need to um, dig a little bit deeper into are the first people of the area. And there have been people here for at least 10,000 years. The indigenous people of present day Santa Cruz County include the Owaswa speaking people of the Kuroste, Chitoni, Sayanta, Aptos, and Yupi tribes among others. Um, and that Zayanti soil, that we've been talking about. Well, that name is derived from the name of the tribe that historically lived in the San Lorenzo Valley, the Sianta. Um, so for some of you that have been joining us for these natural snights, we're gonna, again, do a little refresher on some of these um, topics of fire as a land management tool, but I think it's really important to, to touch on every time it's relevant, so. These tribes helped the landscape and actively managed their resources. When early settlers arrived to California, they mistakenly believed they encountered an untouched wilderness that they described as a wild Eden. But as ethnoecologist Kat Anderson explains in her book, Tending the Wild, the productive and diverse landscapes of California were in part the outcome of sophisticated and complex harvesting and management practices implemented by the indigenous people who had lived on these lands for thousands of years. Tribes like the Kuroste, who are depicted in this mural by Ann Ter Terman, um, near present day and Año Nuevo, tended to the landscape with tools like fire. Indigenous fire is different from the wildfires we think of today. There are low intensity fires conducted in the late fall through early spring because indigenous people burned regularly at least once every 10 years uh, and often every one to three years, there was not a lot of fuel accumulation. These were slow moving fires that would burn up dried thatch, but not kill the native grasses. They would stimulate the germination of annual forbs and grasses, but not burn so hot as to kill the seed bank. So very different fires from the ones we've been seeing in recent years. But with colonialism, these practices were put to a halt. For most of the last 200 plus years in California, government agencies have considered fire the enemy 
a dangerous destructive element to suppress and exclude from the land. Traditional ecological knowledge and landscape stewardship were sidelined in favor of wholesale firefighting and a kind of land management that looked like natural conservation, but actually left the ground choked with vegetation just ready to burn. Even with all of those many years of suppression, though, there are still indigenous stewards today who are working to reintroduce these practices. Here is an image from the Amamutsun Tribal Band and their land trust who steward our region on the ancestral lands of the people taken to missions Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista. They work with other partners such as Cal Fire to implement their traditional ways of relating with the environment, including regular low intensity fires as they were doing here in this picture at the San Vicente Redwoods. And um, I joined a program hosted by the Amamutsun Land Trust a few weeks ago and they um, announced in that that the land stewards were, were actively out doing cultural burns um, as that presentation was going on. And uh, so, you know, recent fires such as the CZU lightning complex of this year, the Martin fire of 2008, the Lockheed fire of 2009, they're devastating for the people who live in those impacted areas. They really are. And one of the reasons why a lot of our more recent fires are so devastating is because there is so much fuel accumulation of, you know, not having as regular fires. Um, but I do, you know, as devastating as they are, I do want to, um, put a spotlight on the fact that they're bringing something to this landscape that has been lacking for a long time too, which is this large scale disturbance. So I do want to kind of end this portion of the talk um, by inviting you to document how this fire is going to continue to impact our landscape. So if you live in a fire impacted area, go out and take pictures of that landscape, go out and take pictures of plants as they as you start to see them pop up, mushrooms as you start to see them pop up, um, and keep doing it over the coming months uh, so that we can we can see how bringing fire back to the landscape is going to affect both our redwood plant communities but also our sandhill plant communities. Um, the Bonnie Dean Ecological Reserve, again, which you see here in this slide, um, this is a picture that was taken, uh, I believe in October uh, after the CZU lightning complex. And you can see there that the fire encroached in, in part of the reserve and then other, another part it did not. So that's gonna be incredibly interesting. But also the reserve is, is currently open. There are parts of the trails that are closed. Um, so please respect those, but you can go and uh, see firsthand the impacts of fire on a sandhills habitat. Um, by visiting the Bonnie Dune Ecological Reserve. And while you're there, take pictures, put them up on iNaturalist. Um, let us know if you have any questions about how to use iNaturalist. Uh, and one of the reasons why I bring this up is because the museum is um, working with other local partners to launch a community science initiative to um, understand the impacts of the CZU lightning complex on our natural spaces. So stay tuned for, for more um about that but for now just you know go out there and and take those pictures i can't wait to to see uh if my spine flower comes back in the spring um and other places to to go if you want to visit the santa cruz sand hills as we um said earlier henry powell redwood state park um there's a great trail and observation uh deck to go visit the sand chaparral um, habitat there. I also just heard that they acquired um, a lot of new acres of Santa Cruz Sand Hills habitat. Um, so I don't know the access um, abilities for that. If anyone here does know, please, please chime in um, with more information about that. But then you can also go to Quail Hollow Ranch County Park, Bonnie Dean Ecological Reserve. And at this point, that's what I have um, prepared for you for our like general overview of the Santa Cruz sand hills. And we're gonna be uh, looking a little bit more specifically at the fossils of this area. But before I invite in our um, partner, if you have any questions, feel free to, to chime in or put them in the chat. Um, I'm gonna be sticking around too, so we can also get to questions at the, at the very end. Um, but it looks like maybe we're about ready for Wayne. Wayne, are you there? Hey, hey. Hey, hey, Wayne. Thanks so much for joining us. 
Um, so Thank again, you. I'll just reiterate that Wayne is a longtime friend of the museum. I believe he's been helping out at the museum since he was what, like a teenager? 16. Yeah. 16. <laughs> um, a few years and, ago. Just, just a few. Um, and now you're helping near 16 year olds in the classroom as a science teacher. Um, but I always enjoy um, seeing our landscape through your eyes, Wayne, because you have a really um, scientific but also poetic view of our natural landscape. So I can't wait to hear what you have to share with us about the fossils of the Santa Cruz Santa. Absolutely. Thank you, Marissa. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with everybody here. And we're going on to take a trip down below the Santa Margarita Formation and take a look at it from underneath. Uh, as Marissa said, it's, um, it's really an experiential um, type of an event when you're out there um, in this ecological environment. Uh, the Santa Margarita is like nothing else. And uh, when I was growing up, I, I grew up here in Scotts Valley. And um, um, as a young kid, it, it really, really influenced me um, as, as a person and as a, um, a naturalist and a person who was curious about um, their natural environment. And um, it, it really um, directed the course of my life, uh, really. The, the fossils there were just captivating. And um, when I grew up, my, my parents started a park in, in Scotts Valley called the Lost World. And that sort of influenced me as well. Um, but the Santa Margarita Formation um, really drove home this idea of, of deep time for me. Um, and that our area has been inhabited for many, many years by so many different creatures um, that uh, um, once I really started digging into it, so to speak, um, um, I really started to get an appreciation for the diversity of life that has existed in this one spot uh, over that deep time. Um, and uh, here, we're going to start out taking a look at some of the creatures without backbones. These are sand dollars. Um, these have the illustrious name of Astrodapsis spatiosis, one of the coolest names in science you could ever imagine. And um, these sand dollars are pretty common in the Santa Margarita, especially up near the top. And uh, they were preserved from the bottom of the ocean when it existed here 10 to 12 million years ago. And um, they're not too well preserved as sand dollars go, but um, not much, <clears throat> excuse me, not much in the Santa Margarita is, is super well preserved. It's a very, very rare event for something uh, to become a fossil. And then it's an even rarer event for something to become a fossil that is preserved in the type of material that the Santa Margarita is made of, which is sandstones and gravels. Um, here we see a barnacle. Um, from Scotts Valley. And um, all these, most of these fossils I'll be showing you, um, you know, were collected back before the sand hills were a preserve. And so back in the 60s and, and 70s, um, this area, of course, wasn't protected like it is now. And um, weekend goers could go out and collect these fossils. Um, I know I was one of them. And, um, and so that's much different now. Uh, you know, permits are needed. And, and whatnot if it's important uh, to collect. But here's a barnacle, fairly impressive. Um, some snails are also found. This is Theus. Here's something quite rare. This is a, a claw of a crab. And um, if you can imagine, crabs are, you know, compared to teeth and bones, fairly fragile. So this is, um, not very common at all. Um, so in, you know, 60 years of, of looking at the Santa Margarita, I've only seen one of these and, and here it is. Um, very, very uh, uh, unusual. Most of the things that um, are preserved in the Santa Margarita are water-worn bones. And these are bones of various types of marine mammals um, and, and in fact, reptiles. Uh, back in the in the mid 80s, uh, um, I was hiking in, in one of the creeks here 
and I found a, uh, a sea turtle. Um, it was about three feet wide and um, just beautiful. But um, um, these mostly are marine mammals uh, that we see as water-worn bones. So they're, they're not well preserved and they're, they've rolled around in the sand and the gravel. And a lot of times these bones have um, um, drilling bivalve or worm borings in them. And that's what these holes here are. There's a special type of uh, worm called a bone eating worm. There's also uh, clams that drill into um, carcasses at the bottom of the ocean as habitats. And that's what you see uh, right here in a lot of these bones. Um, they were um, um, habitat for other creatures before they became fossilized. Um, when I was young, I, uh, I, I really was hunting. I didn't know really what I was looking for. And, uh, you know, shark teeth were, were pretty common back then. But um, once you start looking at a landscape, um, you look for patterns. And one of the patterns I started to recognize was um, I, I would see a rock, let's say this rock here, one weekend. And the next weekend, I'd go out and I see a rock like this. Looks not too similar, but it has these crescent shapes here and this crescent shape kind of matched. Well, maybe in the next weekend, I'd see this rock with, with this area right here. And it looks kind of similar to this area here and maybe this area here. And one of the things in paleontology and, and, and looking at, at natural history is you, you look for these patterns. And, um, and in this case, it turned out that these were not rocks. <laughs> these are the fossilized ear bones of whales, um, highly weathered down. They're called tympanic bullae and they help the whale uh, echolocate. And they're super dense, super, super dense. And they're dense because they absorb sound waves and they transmit sound waves um, very, very efficiently if they're dense. And they're one of the densest bones in the mammalian body. And, um, and so these things that I thought were rocks at one point turned out to be the ear bones of whales and um, pretty fascinating there. And by the way, uh, I can't see anybody's chat. So if you guys have questions midstream, uh, feel free to to uh, to ask in the chat or speak up. I I think uh, I think we had a chat norm here. So um, yeah, I I can just share Wayne that someone was curious about the crab and like how you knew it was a crab. I I'm guessing that they didn't see uh, an obvious crab structure there. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So this right here is the upper claw, right here. This is the main claw right and I can hopefully you guys can see my cursor um, here's here's a little spine on the back side of the claw um, but here's the part of the claw that clamps down um, this is the part you pull out when you're eating a crab claw uh, right here and um, and so so that's uh, that's how I knew it was a crab claw uh, because of that shape there looks better in person too um, Thank you, Marissa, for, for moderating that. I appreciate that. Um, so back in the Sandhills uh, time before the preserve time, um, we would be out there on the weekends and, um, and looking for things. Um, one weekend we were out there and we found um, a fairly significantly sized jaw of a whale. And this is during the time I was working for the museum. And um, we, we got a, a, a group together and we went out and collected that jaw. And um, it was um, in Scotts Valley as well. And it's now on exhibit um, at the museum uh, in the back, um, in this case here. Um, that's one of the more important uh, specimens. Uh, it was that, the previous one was a large whale. This is a small whale, a herpetoceted uh, type whale. And, um, these are much smaller and uh, fairly common in the Santa Margarita. One of the strange things in the Sand Hills habitat is this. And uh, this is a mouth plate, a tooth, if you will, um, of a um, 
of a fish. It's a sheephead fish, a pamela meat upon. And um, these are molluscivores. They, they eat clams. And this is one of the plates in the mouth of these, um, um, of, of this uh, sheephead fish. And here it is, um, what it looks like. I, I actually had a photograph of the mouth and the teeth of this creature in the slideshow, uh, but I could not bring myself to leave it in. And here's why. <laughs> the front teeth of a sheephead fish look exactly like a human's incisors up at the top of your mouth. It's, you, you will not be able to unsee it. If you look at it, it's just, it looks like a human with, with sheephead fish plate in its mouth. It's just the weirdest thing you'll ever see. So I, I, I spared you that experience and you can look it up online if you wish, but uh, it's just the strangest looking mouth of any fish you'll ever see. Yeah, um, thank you for sparing us from that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but this, this may also like aid or add to the, to the weirdness of that, but someone's curious of just the scale of the sheephead fish sample um, and like, I guess how yeah, this is about a centimeter and a half long and about a centimeter wide this way. Thanks. Yeah. Um, here's some fish teeth. A lot of these are fairly common as well in the Santa Margarita. Uh, fish bones are even a little bit more rare, uh, not well preserved, as you can imagine, in sands and gravels. Uh, one of the strangest creatures. Um, is a type of salmon. It's um, Oncorhynchus. It's a spike-toothed salmon. And these used to be called a saber-toothed salmon, uh, much more romantic name. <laughs> and uh, I, would, I would love it if they were still called a saber-toothed salmon, but they're no, the spikes on them that go out to the sides of their heads um, were actually thought to go down like a saber-toothed cat. Um, and they were quite large. Um, two and a half uh, meters, um, seven, uh, seven and a half feet long, and um, fairly large salmon. Shark teeth, of course, are the most common thing uh, that folks find when they go into the Sand Hills habitat. Um, two of the sharks are the most common. These are um, mako sharks of the genus uh, Isurus hastalis. And um, another genus, Isurus planus, is the second most common uh, shark teeth. And as you can imagine, sharks, um, sharks have hundreds and hundreds of teeth in their mouth. And so there's hundreds of thousands of shark teeth fossils. And because they're, they're hard, they preserve well. This is uh, the, the mako shark genus Hastalis. And this is the mako shark genus Planus. Tiger sharks are also found uh, out in the Sand Hills habitats, Galeo cerdo. Spiny dogfish sharks. These are also sharks. They're called a dogfish. They're not a fish. They're not a dog. They're spiny, <laughs> and and uh, uh, and they're a very small uh, shark. Well, at the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, we do have megalodons from the Sand Hills habitats. And um, these were as massive as any East Coast megalodons that um, you will ever find. Um, there's been two specimens, to my knowledge, that are the, the biggest discoveries. This is one of them. You can see it in the museum. And this is found out in Ben Loman. Um, and these sharks were absolutely massive, as you probably have heard. Not quite as massive as, as Hollywood would like to think in recent movies, but um, these things were pushing 50 feet um, long. And uh, I like to take a tape measure out with my students and, and, and roll out 50 feet. And it is impressive, <laughs> uh, quite impressive. Here's another megalodon tooth. Um, these are th actually three separate megalodon teeth that I found uh, <laughs> on three, in three separate occasions, uh, three separate years, it looks like. This one I found back in, looks like 1979, this was 1980, and this is 1979. So 
se three separate specimens, but they look like they go together. So yeah, I always wish. Super, super rare to find that. Well, even rarer than a shark tooth is shark cartilage. And that's what this is. This is uh, um, the backbone of a shark. And it's rare because, well, it's cartilage like your nose. Um, it's, it's not a tooth, it's not a bone, and it usually decomposes, um, except in rare occasions. Well, getting into some of the mammals, um, this is one of our more enigmatic mammals in, in our area here. And um, this is Desmostylus. This is commonly how you find the teeth of Desmostylus in our area. Um, this, <clears throat> it isn't an incisor, um, like you would think looking at this um, or this, but it looks, and here is, a, is another cusp of a Desmostylus, Desmostylus tooth. Um, here's yet another molar. It's a, it's a cross section of one of these Desmostylus molars here. And here is a more complete, um, um, this is a milk tooth pre, premolar right here. And um, there's another view of the Desmostylian molar. Um, when I first started finding these, I had no idea what they were um, until I started doing a little digging, so to speak. And there's a scale. These were massive. Um, Desmostylus happens to be my favorite fossil. My license plate actually says Desmostylus. <laughs> uh, and this is how um, a fairly uh, well-known paleo artist, Ray Troll, um, envisions um, Desmostylus looks, how it looked um, with those big tusks. And, um, and here, here if, it was, if it was social, uh, this is probably how it would look here um, on the shores uh, of the ocean. They were marine. So it's like a marine hippopotamus. Um, pretty interesting creature. Um, we you also have. What, um, sorry to interrupt, Wayne. Do you know what they are like closely related to? That's that's extant. That still exists. Yeah, these are um, these are an offshoot of the Serenia. They're they're not Serenians. They're Desmostylans, um, um, manatees, and dugongs, um, and are their closest relatives and. If I remember right, rock hyrexes, <laughs> which is a, a, a land uh, mammal, um, they're 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 super enigmatic. Um, they're they're an end point in evolution. They don't um, they're not related to anything living today, and they're an offshoot of the main uh, Serenian group. Good question. Um, similarly, <clears throat> this is Paleoparadoxia. And it was named the ancient paradox because nobody knew taxonomically, evolutionarily, who it was related to um, until more recently. And they aligned it more commonly with, um, with uh, Serenians. And here it is. Here's one skeleton at the LA County Museum um, that was put together. A close up of the skull of Paleoparadoxia. And here's our own Frank Perry putting together another species of. Um, one of these early Serenians called Dusty Sire and Jordan I. Um, this is from our own area right here in, in Felton. This specimen uh, was dug up and put back together. This, of course, isn't the actual bones. These are casts of the actual bones. And this is hanging in the museum right now as we are speaking. Um, so if you wanted to see this one, uh, that's where it is. And here's another specimen of Dusty Sire and Jordan I. Um, um, from Santa Cruz that this one is at the San Diego Museum of Natural History. Well, getting into some of the some of the seals and sea lions, walruses, we do have those guys here. Um, this is one of the first primitive walruses we have in our area. This is Amagateria, the walrus Amagateria. Um, lots of people don't know that we have three different species of walrus living right here in Santa Cruz. Um, and this is the tooth of one of them. Uh, one of the more famous ones, uh, too, I would I would uh, say, this is the front end of the jaw of one of those walruses. It's fairly small. Um, doesn't look doesn't really look walrusy. Here's the other side of it. A couple of broken teeth were all that was found. Here's the inside of the brain case of Imagateria, the walrus. 
Here's the outside of that same brain case there. Um, and this is all from, from Santa Cruz, Scotts Valley. Here's the radius, the front flipper bone, um, probably a magateria um, um, walrus. And if you look right here, this bone right here, this radius right here from this amagateria, this is a full flipper that was discovered. Um, that's the same bone as this right here. And so amagateria was probably one of the most common walruses here. Here's the skull of amagateria. This is an adult female. And here is a immature male uh, walrus from the Santa Margarita. We also have uh, eared seals and sea lions. This is uh, Pathanateria, very small tooth, very small um, seal. Um, we also have whale teeth that are sometimes found. Um, this is uh, a pinniped or a whale. Whale teeth look super similar to this and um, from the Santa Margarita um, and very just fascinating. Um, another pinniped tooth here. Um, one of the projects I've been involved with is getting my students to be involved with the Santa Margarita formation in a way that's um, engaging to them. And, and one of the things that I've been doing is having them scan important fossils from the Santa Margarita formation digitally and make three-dimensional prints out of them. And so here we have a, a shark tooth that the students are about ready to scan with this digital scanner. And if you ever wanna get a middle school student engaged with their eyes open and their, their mind completely focused on something, just put a 3D printer in front of them and, and they will just like be engaged for the rest of the day, right? And so here we are in the classroom, um, we're printing out some fossils from the Santa Margarita and trying to figure out how the technology works to bring these fossils into the 21st century. Let's see if I can get this to play for you guys. Hopefully it'll work. And this is the digital copy. And here is the original. As you can see, it looks pretty similar. Actually, exactly, almost perfectly similar. And um, this tooth is from the Santa Margarita formation. And um, about 10 to 12 million years old. And uh, it was collected, let's see here, back in Uh, let's see, 1979 from Scotts Valley. And we're bringing this tooth into the 21st century here. Um, from this digital copy, we can print innumerable um, specimens of it and um, send them off to researchers. So students here in the lab are doing some pretty amazing things. And this is the digital copy. All right. So um, scanning and printing those guys, super fun um, project for middle schoolers. Um, here's a Isurus planus, the mako shark right here. Here's the back end kind of got messed up, but um, it's, it's pretty much an exact copy of the original. And then we can share these with different museums uh, around the country who are interested. Every so often we have a mess up, lots of mess ups, but overall we have a huge, huge amount of fun. And um, fun being the important go-to word right there. All right, if any of you guys find any fossils, know of anybody with fossils, or have any other questions that we don't answer tonight, here's my contact information if you need to contact me. All right. Awesome, thank you, Lane. Thank you so much. Um, there are just so many <laughs> different species that, that you find in the Santa Margarita Formation. It's so amazing. And 
Um, and thanks for pointing out how many of them we've got on display at the museum too. I will say that Absolutely. the museum is currently closed to the public, but we do hope to, to reopen soon. And when we do, you can come visit that. Um, do you see Siren, uh, George and I, I've been saying, I've been pronouncing it a little bit off um, apparently over the years, but, um, and the Megalodon and the baleen whale jawbone. Um, we did have a couple of questions that came in through the chat that I wanted to maybe put past you or right around seven o'clock, so we won't take too much time, but um, uh, someone asked if there are fossils common at the Bonnie Dune Ecological Reserve. I know for me personally, I hear a lot of stories of people finding fossils in Scotts Valley at like Shark Tooth Alley when they were a kid. Um, and it sounds like a lot of the, the specimens you're talking about were in Scotts Valley, but do you know of, um, of the other Sandhill pockets if there are fossils found there? There are a few. Uh, Scotts Valley is much more common because it's higher in the section. There's uh, Bonnie, Bonnie Dune uh, hasn't produced as much as some of the other places, but there are a few every so often. Yeah. And is this something that it is still common for people just exploring, like walking a trail in the sand hills to, to stumble upon something? Or is it a little bit more um, limited now to, to your experience when you were? Uh, certainly, certainly there's, there's more people out there um, walking around, finding stuff. And um, it's more limited now. Um, than it was in the past, um, but still, every you know, every so often, people bring stuff that it's like, wow, really, you found that where? <laughs> so yeah. yeah, super cool. Um, and there were a couple of questions, kind of about the process of like how you know what you know. Um, and so I'm wondering if you could just like share just a little bit about. So someone asked about carbon dating, which I don't know if that's maybe necessary if you're like sure about the formation that it's in, or maybe that was something that needed to happen at a certain point in order to, to date that formation. Um, and then just like the basic process of, okay, you find something, how do you figure out that it's this species? Absolutely, yeah. So paleontologists work have to work together. Um, so uh, stuff that you find, you if you don't know what it is, you network with your your team, with the, with the people who um, are specialists in that particular area. There's people who specialize in, in serenians. There's people who specialize, you know, in, in pinnipeds and whales and um, in invertebrates. And, and you reach out to them. Um, you look out uh, into the literature, um, contact the museum. Those are the three main uh, ways um, of, of finding out what things are um, by talking to people, visiting the museum and um, looking in the literature. Um, in terms of how old these things are, um, carbon dating, of course, um, you, you, you wouldn't be able to use carbon dating on any of this uh, material because it's 10 to 12 million years old. There's other types of um, absolute dating that, that would work. Um, carbon dating only works for uh, 14,000 uh, to 30,000 years, and this is millions and millions, tens of, you know, thousands of times older than a carbon dating process would be able to um, give you an age estimate for. Um, but there's, there's other types of dating, radioactive dating that um, can be used and have been used um, to figure out how old these things are. And just like you, you said, with your experience going out there, you can't really get an idea of how old this stuff is until you're out there and until you reach down and you pick up one of these remnants of a living creature. Um, it's almost like dropping down through the soil and, 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 and the sand and the gravels and going under there and really experiencing this event, this, this event of, of connecting with a living creature that used to be here 10 million years ago. Um, there's just nothing else like it. Yeah, especially when you're, when you're way up in the mountains and you're looking at something that you know just doesn't seem to belong there, a shark tooth there, a whale bone. Exactly. And I did just wanna to share too that um, we're hoping to, to maybe do a walk with Wayne um, in the near future, looking at fossils a little closer to their origin, um, doing like a coastal uh, fossil walk. And so we're still planning that, but um, I'm just gonna put a link in the chat here for if you are not already signed up for the museum's newsletter, you can sign up there and um, stay updated. So if you're interested in um, going fossil hunting, we're gonna hopefully try to do that in a safe distanced way in the near future. So, um, and I think we're, we're a little past seven now, so I don't know if Jen, you wanna um, round us out. 
Yeah, thank you both so much. That was very engaging, very interesting. Um, I know I learned a lot. I hope that everyone watching also learned at least one thing. Um, I didn't even know about the the restrictions on carbon dating, the, the time restrictions. Um, so I feel like I can walk away saying that I learned something. Um, thank you both. This was fantastic. Um, thank you everyone in the audience for coming. This was, like Marisa said, our final naturalist night for a while. Um, maybe we can bring it back as like a limited summer program. Um, we will be sending out an email with a resource list. Uh, the library has compiled a resource list and Marisa has given us some stuff as well. So if you're interested in learning more about sand hills on your own time, um, you can check out some of the books and links that are in that resource list. We also have a link going out through, um, through the same email for a survey. So if you could fill out the survey, that would mean a lot to us. Um, it just helps us improve our virtual programming. You know, it's it's been a couple of months that we've been doing this, but it's always good to get feedback from you. Um, so please go ahead and fill that out. That means a lot to us. And I think, um, I think that's it on my part. So again, thank you both. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this was great. And we look forward to seeing you again in the future. Yeah, thank you all so much for joining us. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, you guys.